welcome to what I think is now, and I always lose track of this, but I think this is the 13th, would that be right, probably the, the 13th Real Business of Wine uh, webcast, and we're going to do something a little bit different this evening. I mean, ideally, we try and do something different every time we do it, um, but tonight we're looking at Burgundy and the broad picture, the business of Burgundy, the wines of Burgundy, um, where Burgundy has come from and where it's going. It's one of my uh, more than favourite regions. What you can see behind me is the village of Milwazi and the Haute Côte, which is where um, I lived um, a long time ago. I went to live there when I was about 20 years old and um, in the days when uh, Burgundy was not 14, 15% alcohol as it was uh, has been in recent years, um, when it was actually picked at 9% and then sugared up to get to 12, which is, seems extraordinary when you look back. So our guest tonight, uh, and basically our, our key speaker tonight is Jasper Morris, who I've known, also known for a very long time, um, Master of Wine, um, author of Inside Burgundy, the man behind a website called Inside Burgundy, which I'm sure Jasper will mention to us. But Jasper is living in Burgundy in a village called Bouillon, uh, across the, the a courtyard from a lady called Becky Wasserman, uh, for whom I used to work a very long time ago, um, who was one of the people who introduced Burgundy to certainly the United States, or grower Burgundy particularly, to the United States and to the rest of the world way back in the 1980s and Jasper has been um, in recent more recent times with um, Barry Brothers and Rudd or part of Barry Brothers and Rudd but now in independent and doing stuff in Burgundy we'll hear more about what you're doing Jasper when did you first go to Burgundy? Uh, good question I think uh, it was the very end of 1981 you were one of the first people I met there because you've been working for but, uh, for Becky, or at least um, uh, hanging out around there in that period. That was the year I'd started my own importing business, and I went at different times of year to different regions in France, and Burgundy came relatively late on. And thank goodness I'd been given an introduction to Becky, and I stayed there overnight, had dinner. Uh, her then husband, Bart, was also there, and he cracked the bottle of La Tache 1966 on that first evening. So we were incredibly lucky, <clears throat> great start, and I remember waking up in the morning and the snow had fallen, and the cows, which were kept out in winter in those days, had their bells on, and it was just a magical place. Now, you probably can't, I certainly would struggle. How, uh, Burgundy was never cheap, even when I lived up in, up in the Loise, um, none of the people I knew, and I was teaching English to Frenchmen and not making much money. Many of my Burgundians couldn't afford to drink Burgundy that often, in the, even in those days, or they would drink wines from the Haute Côte or the Côte Chalonnaise rather than from good villages in the Côte d'Or. But it was far more affordable, relatively speaking, than it is today. Mm. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how you've seen prices evolve over that time? Well, I, th <clears throat> I think the key was that back then there wasn't that much difference between the ordinary wines and the expensive wines. And you didn't have all the massive wine geekery that you've got today. And you didn't obviously have the wine searchers and other websites like that. So people just drank whatever they felt like it. I mean, I know that I would occasionally buy bottles of uh, individual bottles of Grand Cru's uh, from Rousseau Chambertin, which would be about twice the price of uh, uh, a Premier Cru and three times the price of a village wine. Everything was much, much closer together in price. And you were living up in the Oak Coat in the village of Meloise, and people would just have drunk the local wines from their friend down the road. Uh, there was no real concept of, I need to go to Chambon Musny or Vaughan Romanet in order to get something special. I think the other, sorry, the other thing I remember that in those days was you had the broker. I mean, I think that one of the things we could talk about is just how the evolution of the domain, because we all now, I guess anyone watching this takes it for granted that we buy wines from um, domains, as this is what Burgundy is about. Yes. But I think the Burgund, the, 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 um, the growers only really got into the uh, into doing it in any volume in the 1970s after the, uh, the oil crash. And before that, most of the wine was going through the negociant. And I remember um, meeting people who literally only three or four years ago had started to put a barrel outside and a couple of bottles on it because the, the, the negociant weren't actually, or the courtier wasn't coming to, to, to actually buy any wine. And I think that um, even in terms of the media, you're, you, you'd remember 
Edmund Penning Russell, who was Francis Robinson's predecessor at uh, the Financial Times, um, I took him one year to the first estate he'd ever been to, which was um, La Pustor in Volnay. And before that, he'd only ever gone to Negociant. Um, and even in the UK wine trade, there were an awful lot of people in the 80s who still thought of Burgundy as being merchants and you didn't get your shoes well, <coughs> in, in flowers. Absolutely. And that was my incredible bit of good luck to be in the right place at the right time. So when I turned up in 1981, it was right at the start of the domain bottle uh, um, impetus. Um, for which our friend Becky was, I can't say she was solely responsible, but she did an, uh, an awful amount to promote it. Mm. But as, um, as, as she explained, she was a broker <coughs> in, the days, in those yes. days, so there weren't very many of those, and she introduced uh, people like, even like Lafon and, and De Vogue and some very big names to um, the United States in particular. Yeah. There are an awful lot of growers who owe her a great deal. Almost every wine writer owes her a great deal. And uh, also importers. Um, and she, she's done it through um, through love. I was going to, not of the product, but love of the whole concept of Burgundian wine. Anyway, so there was a, a first move to domain bottling after the crash and crisis of the 1930s. And then the second one came after the oil crisis. And to put the counterpoint, I do remember I wrote a little book on white burgundy back in the 1980s. And I went to see some of the big negotiants who I didn't know at this point. And one of them in particular, um, and I <clears throat> may or may not mention his name, but uh, I was welcomed into his office and uh, we were talking about this, that and the other. And, uh, and I said, there's some interesting wines coming from people like Lafont and Lafleur. And he said, Monsieur Maurice, let me stop you there. In Burgundy, there are only four of us. There's me, there's Mr. Uh, Drouin, there's Mr. and so on, and he named uh, uh, two of the others. And then he said, and I forget who the fourth one is. So there was still maybe an attempt in those days for the, the negotiants to try to keep things to themselves. But they did fairly early on, particularly the smart ones. They realized that it was changing and they made sure that they bought more of the vineyards. And now they're right back up at the top of the tree of making cracking wines. But in terms of distribution, and this is part of maybe one of the interesting things that, that people don't talk as much about, you look at the Bordeaux model, and the, this, which of course is in theory has been broken this year with, with no, um, so far with, with no... Delayed. Um, just, yes, <laughs> but certainly uh, changed, put it that way. Um, in Burgundy, you, you had this weird and wonderful November event which was the Hospice de Bone auction, where you tasted wines quite often that hadn't finished their malolactic fermentation, um, or possibly in some cases hadn't even really started it in, in very late years, but certainly in all sorts of stages of, of development. And um, the wines of the Hospice de Bone weren't necessarily representative of the rest of the vintage. Then you traipsed off to the town hall, and then you met all the growers who were pouring their wines of that year and previous years. But you, and you had an, a snapshot of the vintage, but you weren't expected to buy at that stage unless you were bidding for the wines of the hospice, which you had to do through a, through a merchant anyway, through a negociant. Technically, you couldn't just walk in and put, put your hand up. Um, and then later on, we developed this en primeur, this late en primeur Burgundy notion of the tastings in London of uh, wine that was certainly easier to, to, to judge. How That's right. But that, that, wasn't... That to border, how, does that, how has that evolved? Well, the difference between the two is that the Bordeaux EP system, on Primeur system, was led by the Bordelais, whereas the Burgundy later on Primeur was entirely the construct of, uh, first of all, the UK trade, and now it's moved uh, further around. And the UK merchants would just bully the producers into giving them a price at uh, approximately uh, the same time so they could put out a coherent offer. Uh, we used to do ours, my fledgling company way back when, in March, and then everybody tried to come a couple of weeks earlier than the other persons to try and steal a march in the marketplace. And so after a while, the UK trade said, okay, guys, we're just going to do it at the beginning of January. After we come back from Christmas, it'll give us a great kickstart of the year. And everybody sort of played ball together. And there is now the London Burgundy Week when every merchant invites their producers over and, uh, and shows some samples. But the, the driving force there was the international marketplace rather than the Burgundians themselves. 
which is, I think is interesting because that's, a, as you say, it's a big difference. And then we look at the yes. way the wine is distributed where in with the Baudelaire, you have obviously this, this uh, tradition where you have to sell your wine to a local merchant. Even mm. if it's a chateau owner, you happen to own that merchant. And then that merchant then will sell it to a UK or a merchant overseas. Where in Burgundy, we have all sorts of different forms of, of uh, distribution with some exclusivities and some not and so on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, if we're talking about the um, the growers, it's obviously the bigger companies need to have their distribution partner. That's a different ball game. But if we're talking about a small producer, they've really got the option of, uh, well, originally they just say yes to anybody who knocked on the door and said, Please, can I have some? Um, and uh, uh, sometimes they'd say, no, I've already got somebody in this market. Sometimes they'd say, fine, that other person's not taking that much, uh, you can go as well. So in one of the bigger uh, markets, you would either sign up an exclusivity. That's probably more true in the States than it is in the, in the UK. And in the UK, you might find five or six or seven people all shipping from the same small producer. <laughs> Now, I also remember that's one of the things that I've, I actually got, which I might have been drinking right now if I got myself together earlier. Um, I've got a, a, a red uh, chassin, and I remember the days oh, yes. where um, there was a lot more red chassin. And uh, essentially, it was a time where people were wanted to buy white chassin, and you almost forced to buy the red chassin in order to get some white chassin. And there was quite a lot of that kind of, um, I've got some aligote, and you've got the aligote, uh, I need to sell aligote. So if you buy one uh, 25 cases of my Merso, if you want that, you'd have to buy X cases of my Bourgogne Blanc or whatever. And there's quite a lot of... Um, uh, yes, yeah. that still goes on to an extent, doesn't it? it uh, yes and no. It wasn't it wasn't aggressively tied, let me say. But you couldn't just cherry pick a few uh, uh, perfect wines and leave the rest behind. Uh, though, admittedly, it may well be that any given producer would say, "Well, I've got this market that wants to take the less extensive stuff, so I don't mind giving you a slight imbalance towards the uh, more internationally famous stuff." So. It was rarely that you absolutely had to take something, but they would want some sort of balance, uh, particularly if you wanted to have an exclusivity, then uh, clearly there would be a bigger requirement to take across the board. But, um, you know, I didn't often find myself in my days of being a wine buyer having to take a lot of stuff I didn't want in order to get stuff that I did. And in terms of... Um, having to take wine every year. I mean, we've been very lucky yes. in recent years with, with Burgundy quality compared yes. to, if we go back to the, the nasty years of the, of the 70s yes. and 80s, um, there, there was a point where you did, to, to, to get, because the volumes were so small, you yep. did have to buy the difficult years as well as the good ones. Um, well, where it, uh, our customers tended to follow much better in Burgundy than they ever do in uh, did in Bordeaux or indeed the Rhone or other regions. I struggled to buy 84s very much. That was pretty dreadful. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I was able to go through some other lesser years and still take the allocation. 91 was very difficult because nobody wrote about it because of uh, A, it was assumed to have been frosted, which wasn't completely the case. And B, there was the first uh, Gulf War and there was the uh, recession of 93, 4, when one had been selling 91. So I remember struggling to uh, place orders there. Uh, and there would have been one or two other moments when life was a bit difficult. But broadly speaking, uh, we were able to follow um, year in, year out. And certainly one was always looking to do that. So now what I'd like to do is um, introduce now Ellen McCoy, who's been with us on a few other evenings, from who is from Bloomberg in the US, and I know is a, a keen um, Burgundy uh, fan. You know Ellen, I think. Um, I do, already. yes. Ellen, how do you see um, Burgundy sitting where you are in the States? <clears throat> Well, it's it's super hot. Can you hear me, by the way? We can hear you perfectly. I can hear you, Ellen. How are you? We can't see you, but we can hear you. Yeah, are you doing well? <laughs> I am doing well, thank you. Um, I live. I do not live in New York City, for which I'm deeply thankful at this moment. Um, well, what I would say is that in the U.S., Burgundy continues to be 
have this huge following among the geekiest of geeks, uh, as well as a lot of collectors um, who seem undeterred by the uh, by the price rise in the top names. I, I would guess that the biggest question about Burgundy that I get from the Bloomberg readers is, uh, I used to like this Premier Cru and this Grand Cru. Can you give me some wines that are at a lower price point um, that, that will offer some of the same quality uh, and pleasure? Um, and I think it's greatly to Daniel Jonas's credit that in the past few years of the La Palais in the U.S., they have usually had a sort of side seminar that cost a great deal less to attend than the entire Palais, where they shone a spotlight on some of the lesser appellations, for example, and also on some of the sort of like Oxford duress or some wines that perhaps are Lear D, but they're not Premier Cru, and they're but they're above Bourgogne Rouge, um, as well as 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 sort of village appellations. So 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 I think that I'm looking at, is that going to continue, given what's happening now? And I'd love to ask cool. Jasper that. <laughs> yes, yes, Ellen, uh, I, I, I absolutely think so. I mean, you, you've sort of answered your own question with that great <laughs> for where the affordable uh, wines can come from. And uh, it is very much something which I try to do is to, to spread the love um, instead of people just concentrating on two or three top villages. And uh, it might be a good moment to mention that uh, the village where Robert used to live, Menowaz, was famous in the 14th century. It was thought to be better than and sold more expensively than Volney. And uh, perhaps with global warming, it will be back. Um, yes, I have to say, in the time I was there, I saw very little evidence to support that. I remember reading about it at some point. But um, it is, uh, in those days, the haut coat of, of Nui and, and Bowen were very chilly in all but the, the, the rare years. In terms of the people buying Burgundy Jasper, um, that has changed as well. I mean, apart from else, we've got a whole new... Uh, cohort of people from Asia, particularly yeah, Japan first, and I think it's probably some of the most enthusiastic Burgundy lovers I've ever met have been, and most knowledgeable have been in Tokyo, and the people who seem to have drunk more great vintages and more wines than many of my British friends. And now we're seeing that in Japan, in, in China as well. Are you seeing that when you're from where you are in? in I'm just going to stay with Ellen's question for a second longer, because if you were to scratch your right ear, Robert, you would be pretty much on your map behind you on a yes. wonderful vineyard called, not if you keep moving your head. <laughs> that way. Uh, well, go, go back, go, uh, well, anyway, but if you scratch your ear, you would be pretty much uh, on... Uh, this ear or the other ear? ...vineyard called, that ear, yes. Yep. ...vineyard called Clé de la Perrière in Melouze, which I think makes yes. wines. Great, thank you for that. Um, um, yes, the Japanese market is fascinating because there is probably is scarcely a producer in Burgundy that doesn't have uh, at least one agent in Japan, and it's right across the range. They're totally interested in the in the smallest Aligote up to the grandest Grand Cru. In fact, more of the um, I think the the bias would be almost towards the less expensive wines. But um, uh, on the chat, uh, Andrew Haywell just asked a, a, a new question about other wines that I wouldn't like to uh, ship these days. And the joy of Burgundy at the moment uh, is that really there is some super wine, I think, right across the levels. Uh, the issue is much more as, as to whether or not it's worth its price. But I think it, and it's worth saying for anyone sort of under 30 watching this, um, if you go back to when Anthony Hansen wrote his book in 1982, as I recall, certainly the years that I remember, um, I used to say that Burgundy was the most expensive wine in the world at the time because you had to buy so many bottles to get a good one. 
Um, it was oh, well, Fred, yes. and, and, and it was slightly exaggerated, but there was a lot of very bad Burgundy yes. in those days. Not because of vintages, just because of, of winemaking. In terms, I mean, a, a point that Anthony Hansen made at the time was, was chapitalization. Huge amounts of a overcropped and b over sugared wines to bring them up to um, uh, an acceptable, commercially acceptable. And also, there were bad negociants. In those days. Mm. There were a number of negociants whose wines that most of the people I knew who cared about wine wouldn't want to go near, apart from possibly a few of their, their top wines. That's no longer the case, is it really? No. And there were bad individual producers who, who just followed on making the same wine their parents had made and not realising what good wine constituted. And that really isn't the case now. There are some styles of wine being made that might not please you. You might say, oh, I prefer this style to that style. But it's fairly rare that you come across something which is actively... Um, that, okay, so. that, that raises the question, if you like, of sort of, I, I, I don't like the word parkerization, but I'm going to use the, uh, if you look at Californian Pinot, if you look at some of the Sonoma Pinots, which some of which are interchangeable with Zinfandel's at their alcohol levels and their depth of colour and so on, and, and can be delicious as wines, but not necessarily my personal taste in Pinot Noir. Um, that has meant that some of the bigger um, burgundies in, in recent vintages, I'm thinking possibly in very recent vintages, um, actually are accepted by people in a way that maybe they might not have been. We seem to have gone from very dark, uh, not necessarily real burgundy back in the 60s, 70s and so on, which may have benefited from wines from further south, the Rhone, Algeria, whatever. We then went into the, the light uh, the days of, of ultra, always, always ultra pale, but much lighter wines, much more delicate, more floral. And then with climate change, we seem in a way almost to be going back to bigger, darker Burgundy, not because anyone necessarily wants to make them, but because that's what the weather is giving us. Well, as a preamble, I used to buy all my California Pinots professionally from the Central Coast rather than from uh, uh, exactly, exactly. Yes. And, uh, uh, wines and less expensive. Um, yes, there are swings of the, uh, the stylistic pendulum, but one of the joys of Burgundy is it's very rare for the whole region to go off in one direction at the same time. You get little schools that want to head in one way or another, but normally there are still plenty of other people who are going counter-current. So you never quite lose out on everything. Um, I agree there was a moment when oak came a little bit more and the wines were a little bit more extracted, a little bit darker. And now there's a move away from that. There's less oak and lighter colours are coming back. But if now's the moment to mention it, there is also this issue of um, global warming and whether or not that will really make a difference to the style of burgundy of either colour, but I think it'll be the reds which will be affected more. Because we have seen some very high alcohol wines in, in, the last, in the last vintages, haven't we? Well, yes, that's not essential. I think it, it, it's taken a, a couple of people a little bit longer than they ought to have taken to work out. There's this mantra from some that the grapes have got to be ripe. What is ripeness? They talk about partly physiological, but especially phenolic ripeness. Now, if you really want to push this too far, if in 2018, 2019, you're saying I needed to wait for phenolic ripeness, are you saying that there wasn't a single vintage between 1959 and 1990 that was any good because they would all have been much less ripe? So I think a few people are taking the wrong decisions. And I'm not comfortable with Pinot Noir being much about, well, above 14. And I would be perfectly happy to see it at 12 and a half, 13 still. But that raises a, a question that Michel Betan would, would, would be talking about, I think, to an extent, which is that back in the day, you had very very mixed clones in those vineyards, or you, they weren't necessarily planted as clones, and you had unripe, ripe, and overripe in the same vineyards. In more, some of the more recent plantings, I don't mean very recent, but in, in sort of the middle period, you tend to have a more homogenous ripening where everything seems to be getting ripe at the same time, making it harder to make those kinds of uh, blend, field blends, effectively, of, of unripened, overripe. Does that make yeah. sense? Or... 
Um, well, actually, there's a, been a perpetual um, uh, duel between the people who followed the Abbe Tanturier in the 18th century, who said you needed the three underripe normalum overripe, and um, Duvaux Blochet in the 19th century, the sort of ancestor of uh, the, Main, the Main de la Romani Conti, who said that in his 49 vintages, there were only three where he wished he'd picked a bit earlier than he did pick. Uh, so he, he, he was for more ripeness, but even so in those days, that would have meant 12 and a half or 13, and he would have been thrilled with that. Uh, but the, we have reached a tipping point. For the last 15 to 20 years, it's been obvious that you had to pick your Chardonnay at the right moment, or else it would get too ripe, because the sugar can build in Chardonnay so quickly. But in Pinot, it wasn't really an issue, and you could go on counting your 100 days from the flowering as being when you would normally pick. Suddenly in 2018, you were getting a position that if you waited for 100 days, the grapes could be overripe. But if you picked earlier, um, then the tannins wouldn't wouldn't be ripe. And certainly in a couple of the, there are the villages which are very precocious ones normally, like Volney and Chambomusny, there were certainly some examples in 2018 when they were ugly wines because they had um, closed down with hydric stress. But the grapes had started wrinkling, so you got overripe flavours on the basis of an underripe wine. So really, people have got to start looking at changing their viticulture. Funnily enough, I remember being told by someone that there was they used to grow aligote up in the Corton Charlemagne for balance, and I remember quoting someone as, as uh, quoting that, that comment, and I was shot down roundly by one or two people in France. So no, no, it's illegal; it can't happen. So I've got Alice firing um, here, who I'm going to invite to uh, raise the yep. question of natural that wine. Great, I'm just. In uh... Burgundy. <laughs> I really would have rather had Jasper talk about this. I was just lurking, but yeah, what do you want? Hi, Alice. Hi, Jasper, so nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, why exactly am I being brought in again? You, you've got a question about, now we're just, I thought the, the conversation about how natural, natural winemaking or low, let's call it low intervention would, winemaking in Burgundy, um, because Burgundy historically has been one of the lower, apart from the sugaring, obviously, um, it has been a, a relatively low intervention region um, well, compared to many well, others. Relatively, but I think that there's also, um, you know, stuff that was not really very well publicized. There were a certain amount of uh, reverse osmosis machines and concentrators that moved in Jasper when, like in 2002 or 2000. Three. The experiments were earlier, um, and even one of the great domains of um, uh, mm -hmm. Musny, uh, an experiment as early as 93, but deliberately the um, local authorities invested in one of these concentrators and asked him to try it out. And the cuvee of Chambon Musny, um, one particular vineyard, uh, 1993, he did half with a little bit of chaptalizing and half using the concentrator and then gave everybody to taste. Uh, and he said it actually broke down relatively clearly that most people in the US preferred the concentrated one and most people in Europe preferred the chaptalized one. So what do you <laughs> conclude from that? I don't know. But that person that has never gone on using one, uh, there are some domains uh, to in Von Romane who have retained their machine and but they don't have much use for it obviously in recent years but i think in, in many ways some of the other things for example using um cultured yeast commercial yeasts only really i mean only people began to look at it i think in the, the beginning of the 80s and it was something mm -hmm. that was very frowned on by by many and it was picked up by some but i, I was, think that that has changed i mean i i, I certainly and even contributing to this in front of Jasper, I'm, ja I'm blushing on my apartment on Elizabeth Street. But in blind tastings that I've done at the Beaver Bay over the years, um, it was very obvious that many people were using the approved yeast. And when people are not yeasting, that jumped out. Now, what I have seen in the past four years, a dramatic decline of added yeast and cultured yeast, and a great increase of a return to native yeast and fermentation across the board. I think pretty much most of the great domains and even less, you know, are using native yeast. What yes, do you think? and sometimes they were trying to fool us, and sometimes I think they're fooling themselves. I would, people say, oh, I only use natural yeast, but, uh, you know, maybe 
if right to start off with the very first ferment, uh, maybe I'll kick that off to make sure that something is going. Maybe I'll kick that off with an inoculated yeast. And of course, that yeast is then going to spread throughout the winery and do the job on the others as well. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that also raises the question we're talking about intervention, which of um, Giacad, the, the Svengali um, of, again, those, those early years, who was the person who was really associated with um, the cold soak of macerating the grapes before fermentation as a as a technique rather than something that actually happened in many years anyway, because fermentation didn't necessarily kick off in all the vats at the same time. Um, how much of a mantra, because that became a mantra, some people were very much against it when it came in, and then bit by bit, because one or two well-known estates did it and success, successfully did it, how much of a, of a thing is that form of winemaking today? Well, well, let me talk about the basic principle that happens time and again in Burgundy and probably elsewhere. Somebody develops a particular technique for a good reason, sometimes because it's a little bit of it is great, uh, and then other clowns say, oh, well, if a little bit of it is great, then I'll do more of it, and the more I do it, the better it must be. So the 200% new acres, the people who stirred their barrels to... Um, way beyond what's sensible for white burgundies. The cold soak uh, was taken much too far um, uh, as well. And the other thing is you can have some techniques which might be useful to help you out against a particular difficulty, which then become a standard use. So there was a moment when everybody was green harvesting, but that's bad news because it means you're not training your vines properly. And there's Recently, everybody has been deleafing left, right and centre, and that's really dangerous. You don't want the sun on your Pinot Noir grapes. Uh, a, a bit of light and a bit of air, sure, but not the direct sun, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, my feeling, I don't know what Alice's take is on this, is that on the whole in Burgundy, people have been not amongst the most interventionist in the world in the last, let's say, 20 years at any rate, but there have been very few who've gone all the way towards what might be called um, natural, and possibly that's to do with the fact that the... Uh, uh, the selling price of bottles from the top appellations is so high um, and indeed the wines have been selling that there hasn't been a need to reinvent that whereas it's been done a lot more in Beaujolais and the Jura where the pricing is is uh, is less high. Yeah, no, I certainly agree there though even that said there is certainly an increase of uh, more of in your own working either hardcore naturally or mostly. Um, there's certainly more that would fall under actually the new category that we talked about last week about wines by nature. So we're doing like 30 ppm. What I do see and is just way more thinking, individualistic thinking about I've been following um, these, you know, these fashions in the past. Um, shall I rethink them? On the other hand, maybe natural wine is one of the fashions that's starting to come in and maybe people are trying to follow that fashion a bit too much as well. I don't know. There's um, what goes up comes down, right? <laughs> oh, Polly, you had a question, I think, for both I, Alice I have a and question. Jasper. I, I have a question. I have a question and an apology for Alice because uh, actually, Alice, I dragged you in because of an article <laughs> that you wrote last year um, for food and wine that really stuck in my memory. <laughs> the main down to Leonia. Yeah. Exactly, where you talked about a sub 30 year old next generation right. female winemaker who came in and was, was making changes. Um, and I would just like with both of you on here can you talk a little bit about from issues of climate change to natural wine to um, vinification general practices what are we seeing coming from these next generation what are they learning how are they adapting how might they be changing practices in the vineyard Jasper right uh, Alice do you want to <laughs> all right sure um, <laughs> Well, one thing that I do see is that they are uh, their first line of action is the vineyard and very seriously uh, looking at different pruning techniques and not deleafing and uh, so basically looking at the plant to how to deal with climate change first. Um, that I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about first. That's what I see. 
and a, a number a number of them have gone very high with the canopy. So a, a bit like the the oldest of them all, no, actually, uh, La Lubie's Loire, led the way on this, but the younger generation are following. It, yes. Enormous great canopies up above two meters, and mm. not doing any um, uh, hedging of them at all uh, on the grounds that that is an unnatural practice. Uh, hedging and, uh, and the volume reacts by trying to push out more things because it thinks you're taking away bits of it. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to pick up on, that. on the question. Actually, the earlier, my earlier point. Andrew Halliwell had said, "What are the negative attributes associated with over long cold soaks?" Briefly, have you any thought on that? Uh, I have uh, just prepared. I, I've been typing away a little answer. <laughs> uh, this is what Carol Vorhaus of um, Maison Camille Giroux uh, mm. said. He doesn't use it at all nowadays. And for him, he says that the um, the anthocyanins don't bind and aren't protected during cold soak. So uh, he doesn't like the nature of the colour. I'll just send that through. There, it's appeared on the chat. Oh, well, thank you for that. Um, and, David, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, 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 that's uh, done on that. It, you've just, because we're moving into talking about sort of natural and uh, organic and biodynamic, we've got David Sular from the Chateau de Pomar, and that raises the issue of, of biodynamics, I suppose, in the region. Generally, you mentioned uh, La Lou, Bies Le Roy, Le Fleuve. Uh, how, how, much, how is uh, biodynamic um, viticulture spreading within Burgundy, Jasper? And David, um, do you, what, what do you see as an interest to you when you're talking, because you're promoting the, the, the wines internationally, how much is there an association of biodynamic with Burgundy? Um, David first. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, so, I think at Chateau de Pomar, we... Uh, um, uh, the, the, the decision to go biodynamic was really um, was really something uh, about the terroir, and especially in Burgundy, I think more than ever, ever, uh, everywhere else, uh, the terroir is is important, and the reflection of the terroir um, in the wine is, is crucial. Crucial, uh, and then I think the the biodynamic um, viticulture was probably the only way or at least the best way for us to express that and and for me as a sales manager for for europe uh, i would i would i would say that uh, it's growing a lot there's a lot of like demand especially in uh, norway sweden um denmark finland all this kind of uh, scandinavia uh, where um, uh, people really care about what's in their wine, what's in the bottle. They really want to have traceability. And um, and I would say like the north of Europe is really leading this way um, for us at least. Uh, the UK as well is, is really picking up, uh, I think, on organic and biodynamic, uh, natural wine as well. We see more and more. And I would say that so far for us, uh, that's, that's mostly the north of Europe where the demand has been the strongest for, for this kind of wines and, and really kind of um, having the story, having the, all the, the information about what's in the wine, what's, uh, um, how the wine is made, and yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, Jasper? <laughs> yes, uh, I've got uh, three quick points to make, so I'll, I'll, I'll say them speedily. The first is that when it started, biodynamic started in uh, uh, Burgundy, it came from two <laughs> One of which was the uh, the crowd I call the, the leftover hippies, the Sosantuita, people like Didier Montchauvet. But probably the biggest strand was from the very top, Le Roi, Domaine de la Romney Conti, Le Fleuve, La Fon. I may not have gotten more Lafarge, I may not have gotten more in the, in the right order. They don't all have to begin with L, but most of them. No, exactly, apart from Domaine de la Romney Conti. <laughs> um, uh, the point about this is that these were people who were already selling their wines extremely well, were thought of as being the best producers there were. They had a huge amount of risk by going for this thing which scientists have often poo-pooed and other people have said, oh, they're only doing it for marketing reasons. Those domains absolutely weren't doing it for marketing reasons because it was, it was a marketing loser at that point rather than winner. Uh, second thing is that uh, where I've been able to see domains making the change and Lafon is the one I know best, I started to see consistently the same changes, the greater precision in the wines, the greater identification with the uh, plot of land, 
And once, in fact, tasting at a, um, a lineup tasting during the Grand Chaux de Bourgogne, I tasted with a grower who I didn't know very well. I'd heard of them, heard they did good things, Grossignol Trappé. I tasted the first few wines and liked them. And then I hit the Chapelle de Chambertin, and it was something electric in that wine. I said, wow. And my first reaction was, you've made this differently. You've grown this differently, because that's how it felt to me. And they said, you're absolutely right. That's the one vineyard which for the last five years we've been doing biodynamically. And that was our experimental um, uh, vineyard. And now we've, we've converting all the others. But it was absolutely night and day electric. And in terms of making it spread, uh, I was doing a, a panel at um, IPNC in the Oregon Pinot you know, Conference. And uh, I was doing a conversation with Dominique Lafont. And somebody asked the question. He said, but if you go biodynamic, aren't you worried that your neighbors might contaminate you? And he replied, he said, no, I have contaminated my neighbors. They've all decided to go biodynamic as well. So well, it was just spinning a line or not, I don't know. It was a good story. But I mean, the, the, the question really is with climate change, not so much heat and climate change, but the, 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 the tempestuous, the changeability from year to year. Being organic, fully organic or biodynamic is, isn't easy in a region like Burgundy. There, um, it, 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 there are risks involved, aren't there? Yeah. We know we can do it. And also what happens is that the big risks are in the first few years when A, you probably haven't learned quite how, how to do it properly, but B, the vine hasn't learned the new rules. And so in those early years, almost everybody loses the best part of a, uh, of a vintage. Uh, but after a while, those growers report back to me and say, no, their vines are coming through the difficult weather conditions better than they feel their neighbours are. Again, they have a reason for saying that. So, uh, you know, you need an outsider to go and sniff around their vineyards and, and check it out. But that's my impression. And I would think Alice would bear that out too. And probably uh, David now with the chef de Poma. Now, going back, you look at the, as I said, I used to live up, up there in Loisé, but there are other villages, Fissin, um, up near Dijon as far as I can say, never made particularly likable wine back in the days. They tended to be tannic and tough and um, somehow or other never really achieved the richness of, of fruit as, as you got down towards chivry Chambertin, Mai saint and the other villages. How are you seeing the changes as the climate changes? Which are the villages that you're seeing now making the kinds of wines that are appealing, possibly more affordably than, than some of the villages that we would know and love? So uh, what causes tannins in wines, and it's two things really, uh, it's, it's coming out of the, the, the soil or the terroir in its larger sense, but also when the wines aren't properly ripe. And some of the cooler areas with wetter soils uh, were typically delivering these sorts of wines. And in 2018, Pomar has absolutely aged it. The wines in Pomar are brilliant in 2018. Of course, I mean, still going to make them well, but um, it's just not sideways. And as a result, early this year, um, before we got locked down, I've been to see a lot more producers in Papua than I would normally get around in a vintage survey. Uh, Fisa is doing very well. And there again, we've got an exciting young producer um, in Amelie Berto, who's really leading the way there. Um, some of the other uh, sort of back villages, the Ose Dures's, which are typically a little bit, I mean, it's in the name, Dures, hard, mm -hmm. uh, they're doing better. But uh, those sorts of locations are the ones which, if anything, are gaining out of the global war. And if we then move out of the, the Cote d'Or, um, down the bits of Burgundy that, that don't tend to get as much of a mention, the Mercurés and the Ruiz, mm. the Cote Chalonais, um, how worthwhile, and indeed, let's move, move Or north, up to Irancy. I was, that was exactly where I was going, the sort of place where Irancy was never much fun to drink in, in any but the very warmest vintages. How are you seeing those sort of uh, satellites, we, we could call them, if you like? Um, yes, it's still, uh, the Coach Chalonaise gets forgotten about, and then every so often, every generation, somebody writes an article saying, you know, Burgundy's forgotten the secret, and then it gets forgotten again. Uh, but there are, what, what uh, the Coach Chalonaise has really needed is a couple of uh, locomotive domains that will really put it on the map. And I think we're beginning to see a bit more of that. And I actually did <coughs> several days tasting there in February and uh, came up with a lot that's exciting. I still get too often tannins, which are a bit rude in Mercury, and Givry seems to be coping better. But um, I think we will see 
an increase in quality out of the coach on layers, the oat codes in the code door, and some of the satellites up in uh, the the Grand Oxewa, um villages like Epinoy, as well as Iransi and the Côte d'Oxer itself. Now, the, the, the elephant in the Burgundy Room, which I, I have to bring up because I've got various bottles. So. I'm guessing it's not going to be about red wine. It's not red wine, it's white wine. And I remember talking, and the first thing I'd say is, speaking as a, as a former uh, consumer wine writer, um, the, the whistle was not blown on prematurely oxidized white burgundy by the media. It was, it was blown, as far as I was aware, really, by enthusiasts, the wine berserkers and others who started to look at it amongst themselves and say, there's something wrong here. And they, and I remember talking to a very well-known um, French critic and I slightly charged him with him not having said anything about it. He said, no, no, well, it's not to be talked about, but I don't buy white burgundy anymore, um, which I thought was a relatively shocking uh, attitude. How I think you're talking about a very, very well-known French. Uh, how do you, <laughs> I mean, but literally we all, uh, the, the number of times we're coming across bottles of, of white burgundy from good uh, estates um you know we know there was a very bad period where it was it was extraordinarily uh, frequent we still find them and uh, firstly um the question is why what 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 is the explanation for sort of a generation of white burgundies to be dying earlier is it corks is it sulfur is it is it um stirring what is the reason and b where do you think we are now Okay, well, it, it's so complex. It really is multifactorial. Corks do not cause it, but a wine under cork is much more likely for it to happen. The other closures prevent what might have happened from happening. So you see it in wines which are still under cork rather than screw cap or diam. And so, sorry, just to interrupt there, how do you, do you think that more people are going uh, to shift across to DM and to screw cap because screw cap is still not generally no I wish I love screw caps so to, but uh, but no uh, screw caps not winning the battle at least DM's not doing badly though are they you, you're seeing D- DM's doing uh, doing very well yes um, <clears throat> the thing I can't get my head around is why was it quite so sudden with perhaps 95 and certainly 96 vintage that this phenomenon started all the reasons which are given do not sound to me like something which has uh, a starting point that's as abrupt as that. Mm. Because the pneumatic presses, which some people have accused, uh, were around well before then. Yeah. Um, cork, admittedly, did hit their very worst at that point. And uh, so in the very early days, I think there were some genuine cork issues. If you look at a 1996 cork, if you pull out a bottle, it is often grey because they were treating them in a different way, a bit of hydrogen peroxide, I believe, which would then eat up the sulphur that was in the bottle. People were using lower sulphur levels, but I don't think that alone uh, caused... And not everyone, not everyone was... And not, and not everyone. One of the general problems is that the success of red burgundy, when everybody said how elegant it is, uh, Pinot Noir, it is a ballerina, etc., etc., they started trying to make in their heads Chardonnay in the same way. They tr- tried to make really elegant Chardonnays, but Chardonnay is a brutal great rugby player of a, of a grape, and it doesn't want to be made super fine like that. So if you start uh, cleaning up your, joy, uh, your juice to uh, not to use the solids in the fermentation, uh, you're throwing out the thing which protect the wine. And of course, the red grapes have got their skins to protect them, and the white grapes haven't. And people have stopped crushing before they press, and the crushing gives you a minimal amount of um, skin contact, not enough to change the flavours in a significant way, but enough, I think, to be beneficial. And those nice old Vaselin um, hydraulic presses, they used to crunch up the grapes inside. And Everyone says, no, no, I do not want to have my grapes trituré, uh, i.e. mashed up. But it doesn't matter for Chardonnay. It really doesn't. Um, the extra ripeness may be part of it. Um, batonage initially was used uh, a, a, as an antioxidant because you're nourishing the wine with the lees. But again, it's a technique that took far too far and stirred things up too much. And as a result, uh, they probably were allowing oxygen in. Well, that's multifactorial, if you like. 
certain vintages were more likely to have it for a particular reason. 96, because they didn't want to go through their malolactic fermentations. 2002, because they were being racked or bottled during the heat wave of 2003, so on and so forth. It's happening less now. People are taking a lot more care. They are checking to see how much dissolved oxygen is in the wines, because if you have a filling head with eight, uh, eight heads on it, you would actually find that each of those heads was working slightly differently if you weren't monitoring them, and you were getting much more oxygen in some bottles rather than in others. So there's all sorts of technical things. We won't go into them all now. It'll take too long. Um, and my final thing is, I think to some extent, this is a passage that the wines go through and that they do, in many instances, revert. And do you not remember, Robert, when we were young and we occasionally used to drink uh, white Rome wines and everybody said, you've got to drink them really young or wait 20 years because in between they will appear to get oxidized. And I think <coughs> that is and is affecting white Burgundy and indeed lots of other white wines throughout the world. And, and maybe, maybe it's something we're going to get used to in Burgundy in a way that we, we weren't. Well, Ellen, Ellen, did you have something to, to chip in on that? Uh, no, I didn't didn't really have anything to say, but I I wonder if uh, Jasper could say something about the whole proposal, the INAO proposal to remove Chablis or parts of Chablis from being called Burgundy and moving in a lot of Beaujolais uh instead i wonder if he could talk about that what's the status of that now etc there's a lot of misinformation about that subject shabli was never threatened in any way there was never any question of shabli not being called uh part of burgundy what was an issue is that various people from down in the beaujolais said when the rules were first drawn up, we should have been part of Burgundy, and we aren't. We want to be allowed to call our wines, uh, if they're Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, we want to be allowed to call them Bourgogne, uh, which at this point they haven't been allowed to. So the INAO, who are sort of um, Cartesian bureaucrats, if you like, at base, <laughs> and, and so they should be, no problem with that, said, OK, we'll look at this. And they then said, well, if you want to uh, increase this area here, the quid pro quo is that we will remove bits which are allowed to call themselves Bourgogne, but hardly anyone is doing it. Now that, in ah. if in the Chablis region, you have some Bourgogne Blanc, or you have some Bourgogne Rouge, and I know one grower in Chablis who's actually got in his Chablis Premier Cru, has got some Pinot Noir vines planted since the 1950s, and he can only sell them as Bourgogne Rouge. So those which were previously called Bourgogne, were going to be removed. But anybody, everybody, everybody rioted and stormed up to the, to the offices <laughs> and the INAO who said, OK, whatever we do, we're not going to take away any existing Bourgogne. We will leave to a future moment to decide whether we can add anything from the Beaujolais. So most of the problem has gone away. And it was a little bit of slightly inaccurate in reporting at the first instance that suggested that something called Chablis could be threatened. Uh, Polly, you've got a, 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 a businessy marketing question, I think. I, I do indeed. So I'm lucky enough to be a New Zealander. Um, yay. And yay. Um, and shout out to the handful of New Zealanders who wake up very early to be in the attendee list. Um, so it, Burgundy has done something that very few other regions have done, which is you have embraced a key competition in terms of the exchange, the the Central Otago and the Burgundy exchange. Um, I would love to see more of this in the wine industry. I will tell a tiny anecdote, which is I'm in lockdown in Barcelona. And when Eric Asimov talked last week about comfort wines and my comfort wines consistently have been finding Burgundian wines that I can get delivered to my apartment here in Barcelona because they do have this, this sense of home for me. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of this kind of collaboration and maybe give some insights that other wine regions could take on board and uh, and look toward a better, happier partnership with people who might otherwise be our competitors? Uh, yes, it's a brilliant idea. And um, not uh, this January, February, but a year ago, 
I was in Central Otago at their, you know, conference with Nick Mills, who's the person who really put together that link between Burgundy and uh, Central Otago. And he was doing a 10-year retrospective at the end of which he said, and by the way, that's the end of the programme, which nobody had been expecting. Oh, no. However, other people said, no, we'll take it on. But uh, it, it was time. Well, we had the, just to interrupt, uh, Jasper, the thing about Burgundy is we, we started off with McMinnville in Oregon as well. We've had yeah. a number of, I think it's in, it, something to do do with the Pinot Noir grape in Burgundy that yeah. brings people together from various places that we haven't yeah. seen with other varieties. I know, and it, it, it worries me. Uh, there are probably seven or eight, or would be if it weren't for lockdown, there are seven or eight different Pinot conferences going on around the world every year. How many Chardonnay conferences are there? Yeah. Chardonnay desperately needs it to get itself back to where it ought to be. We need to be talking about it, and uh, both technically and, and just in general. Anyway, that's by and by. Yeah, no, Burgundy has. Um, I think what's true, uh, with, with the Pinot grape, you can only grow it in a small-ish number of other locations. But it tends to be, whether it's New Zealand or Oregon or California, wherever else, we tend to be talking about a handful, or now a big, several handfuls, of producers, more than regions as a whole. Um, and I've followed the whole New Zealand Pinot you know, story almost from the start. I first went in the mid-90s, and uh, I've been back every sort of three years or so since, due to be going to the big Pinot you know, conference in, uh, it's going to be Wellington in uh, next February, but of course, whether that will happen or not, or whether we'll feel like travelling again, I don't know. But um, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it was a great question to ask, uh, Polly, because it's, it's really so important. And I know a lot of the growers, it's great for young Burgundians to go and do some work over in, be it California, be it New Zealand, be it anywhere else. And equally brilliant to have them over here in Burgundy during harvest time. No long may it last. So finally, and back to the question of price, and it's not actually it's something I looked at a, a few weeks ago in, in Meiningers. Um, it's not so much the fact that Burgundy prices have gone up and up. I, it's, when I was at a, one of the Ampli Merte scenes in London, and a couple of wine, British wine writers were saying, yes, but I could never afford to buy these wines. And I suddenly thought, actually, that one of the dangers we have with very limited production uh, batches of wine, which we have in Burgundy, uh, actually a lot of the, uh, the over, not the oversight, but what the critics would have done traditionally, a lot of those people, and I was one of them, aren't necessarily seeing the wines as much as they did. Because unless they're able to buy them and, they, and they're to afford them is, is now becoming more and more difficult. We're, talking, we're now at a point where I think a lot of the discussion of Burgundy has moved away from the writers and has moved into the enthusiasts amongst themselves, the people who can afford, or whether they can't afford and just do it, are talking about the wines amongst themselves more than I would say it happens, for example, in, uh, in Bordeaux. Is that a fair view? Yeah. I, I would say so. Certainly... Um my opportunity to taste and drink the really fine wines is, uh, is when I go to Asia. Uh, and, uh, or indeed, it could be also in New York and so on, but it so happens I've tended to go more yeah, east than west. Uh, and there's a whole group of real enthusiasts uh, uh, who have built in a very short space of time an incredible knowledge, and they've got the money to buy the wines, they've bought the wines, and, and they're happy to share them. Uh, but otherwise, yes, you're right. Uh, it's the whole um, information technology has enabled people to work out for themselves what they don't want to do and then meet up and chat with uh, like-minded people. So in that sense, I th uh, in that sense, what you say is true. I think perhaps for tasting the very young wines uh, from the barrel, then there's still a strong role for the, the, the expert uh, critic. And just actually that whole point of tasting, I think we're nearly out for time, but um, I remember uh, being at one of those McMinnville events and there was a question um, of, uh, I think uh, it was a British speaker that said, you know, I, I'm not sure that Burgundy necessarily does improve over time. It, it actually evolves, it changes, but I, I like it when it's three or four years old. And I was sitting next to a British master of wine, you know, called Mark Savage, who said nonsense. Mm. It's absolute nonsense. I prefer it when it's in the barrel. Um, there is that question of when is the best, does Pinot Noir, does Burgundy necessarily improve or does it just turn into something else? I'm not necessarily talking about the greatest of Grand Cru that need the time, but in terms right. of some of the Premier Cru's and others, is there a younger date that you think actually this is the time to grab it while it's still got that freshness? 
Well, that is one opportunity to drink it. Uh, my rule of thumb is if it's a great vintage, which is going to develop secondary interesting things going on, then you absolutely should keep it. And I bought a whole load of just straight Bourgogne Rouge from different producers in 2005, and I'm drinking them now with enormous pleasure. And they've gained a little bit. They're never going to be as complex as uh, further up the scale. But you get a vintage like 07, 11, uh, possibly 14, maybe 17. They're just gorgeous to drink young, and they won't actually develop uh, all, all that much. Can I, um, may I just mention a question which I've seen on the screen? It's just come up on the screen, and I'm going Where's to invite Lotta to actually say it, actually. Lotta, Carolina. Brilliant. Would you like to say, yes. Hi there. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Not very well, but go ahead. Okay, perfect. So, Lotta's, yeah. in, Ger- Lotta's in Germany. I know that. Yeah, so um, my question that uh, I'm asking myself actually for quite a long time is like, you're in Burgundy really much focusing on Grand Cru's and Premier Cru's and you have your designated origins. You have Chardonnay and Pinot Noir as given. Um, I know in the Mosul region, Geisenheim has made some rescue plans to plant some Pinot Noir there. Um, on long term instead of Riesling, which um, sounds maybe insane, but um, my question would be like, do you think Chardonnay and Pinot Noir would do it on the long term? Um, I mean, Bordeaux has introduced some new varieties too. It's a good question. Okay. Uh, I remember remember meeting you in Bordeaux for the MW uh, student seminar there, or whatever it was, three years ago. Um, Now, In Burgundy, I cannot imagine Burgundy without Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, especially the Pinot, as being their their major grapes. I can't see that the grapes which flourish further south would be a success if they came further north on what is, after all, uh, an alkaline soil, whereas your Syrahs and Gamays flourish on um, uh, acid soil. Uh, So... I don't think the magic of those vineyards will still be there if we can't have Pinot and Chardonnay growing in them. Mm. What we're really going to have to do is change the viticulture in order to make it possible to continue for a while ahead. And if it gets sufficiently warmer that you can't have Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, then we're probably going to have greater worries than where our next glass of wine is coming from. So um, I'm, I'm very much hoping at any rate, and I certainly don't think that there needs to be any major challenge uh, to those two great varieties over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, who knows after that? I think, Jasper, we are two minutes over, which is actually very good for us. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity of, or letting you have the opportunity of plugging um, your your book and your and your website, in, uh, yeah. Inside Burgundy. Do you want to say a word on it while you're here? Well, the book's out of print and I'm working hard and this lockdown is helping me on the second edition of that. So that should come out during next year. And uh, otherwise, I have my website because the book is no place for tasting notes um, because they go out of date too quickly. But uh, I've got in the first 15 months, we got up about 10,000 different tasting notes and other bits of information. So if anybody is still feeling rich and wants to subscribe, uh, annual fee, it's www.insideburgundy.com. We would be thrilled to have more people on board. Thank you. Jasper, I'd like to say thank you very much for um, doing a really great job tonight. I'd like to say also thank David, Ellen, and Lotta, and obviously Polly, my partner in crime, and everybody else who's attended. This will be a uh, this will be a video on YouTube within the next forty eight hours. With any luck, um, and there's a whole lot of others. So please head over there. Please subscribe, because that's actually where you'll find out what's happening next. Um, We've got other things this week. We're going to be talking about tourism. Tomorrow, we've got a very different session. Polly, do you want to talk about tomorrow? Because it's very much your session tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going practical. I'm so excited by this. We're talking about uh, best practices for e-commerce and winery websites and communications. And we have a panel coming in made up of folks like me, who that's all they do all day long, every day. But I want to give a great big thank you to Jasper, because I, I, I don't deal with what's inside the bottle as much as I do what's outside the bottle. And I learn so much from these one-on-one style of conversation. So this is brilliant tonight. Thank you, Jasper. Well, thank it's you. been great. And Robert, you and I and everybody else who knows her should raise a big glass to, to Becky Wasson. Becky Wasson, absolutely. Um, so please much. say hello from me. Thanks. We'll do Take that. Care. Okay. 
，拜拜，拜拜。拜拜